An introduction to the series, The I State and the Other. Caveat emptor. Uh, when I contemplated the possibility of sitting down to share in a coherent, structured manner my assumptions of what I term the reality of power and how an understanding of the reality of power equips us as individuals and free associations to be less entangled with systems of coercive governance, I, I had a few concerns about engaging in such an endeavor, and I want to share this, these concerns because in so doing, I also have an opportunity to introduce to you some of these assumptions which will be laid out more thoroughly as the series progresses. One such concern was based on my experiential knowledge of how my understanding of the reality of power, even my understanding of the nature of the coercive enterprise model, the state, has shifted over the years. What if, for instance, I commit to hmm, semi-permanent form these assumptions that later on through an acquisition of new information and experiences, I come to reject, even vehemently oppose. After all, I, I, I've i already experienced this personally with many writings and videos and uh, even podcasts that I produced during periods of time when I supported the coercive enterprise model uh, because I imagine it was a necessary evil that could be held in check so long as that necessary evil was hemmed in by the concept of rule of law. The other primary concern is the inherent danger of producing a cohesive system, a pattern of analysis, outlines for human governance standards, etc., that can be co-opted and even deployed for systems of thought that might actually run counter to an end goal that I was hoping to achieve through expressing my thoughts systematically in the first place. And one could argue that many of the ideas expressed by Karl Marx, for instance, produced systems of governance that did not lead to the imagined end of history through the closing of the dialectical loop as he hoped for, but rather produced systems that had even greater disparities between the classes that had produced even more extreme dialectical cycles. And whether you agree with Marx's end goal or not, you can easily see that agents who claimed the Marxian succession produced systems that had decidedly betrayed the end goal expressed by Marx himself. These systems led to the murdering of millions and the reduction of individuals to little more than disposable mechanisms of the unaccountable state. And I don't, I don't pretend to suffer from such hubristic notions that I imagine the thoughts I will be expressing in this series will offer the, the same revolutionary potential as did the ideas of a Marx or a Bastiat to offer a counter to the Marxian assumptions. Yet, the concern does exist that ideas can sometimes become larger than you can really imagine that they can be, and that ideas begin to take a life of their own as individuals outside the idea's originator, take those ideas and make them their own, uh, altering them in ways that are mostly, I would argue, unpredictable, in ways that could produce positive evolution of the originating ideas in the sense that the ideas increase the chance that the end goal of the originator of the ideas increases or could produce negative devolutions of the originating ideas in the sense that the ideas decrease the chance that the end goal of the originator of the ideas decreases. When I weighed these two concerned against concerns against the reasons to dare put to the proverbial digital pen my assumptions in a more developed, systematic form, I, I came to the conclusion that I would go forward with my efforts. That's why you see me here right now, or listen, you're listening to me, or whatever the case might be. Why, why, why do you ask, if you're asking at all? I'm not owned by my ideas. Uh, that is to the degree that I have a level of self-awareness that allows me to consciously act in ways that demonstrate this lack of ownership. Nor do I own the ideas that I articulate, again, to the degree to which I have a level of self-awareness that allows me to consciously act in ways that demonstrate this lack of ownership. Rather, 
I recognize that the ideas I will be expressing here as the are the product of an amalgamation of self-observation, self-discovery, and more significantly, the product of an understanding of ideas I've gathered from multiple sources ranging from the Bible to Bastiat, from Hegel to Wittgenstein. In word and deed, in various forms, I already manifest my thoughts, the very thoughts that I hope to systematically outline in this series. So I'm already daring, if you will, to share thoughts with the world that can influence others in ways that are largely unpredictable by me or anyone else, I would wager. While articulating these thoughts in a more uh, systematic, cohesive, all-in-one-place manner could potentially increase the likelihood that my ideas could be co-opted in ways that would ultimately run counter to my end goals, I, I, I can't be sure that articulating my ideas in a more systematic way might not actually reduce the opportunities for individuals to be more negatively, subjectively speaking, influenced by my ideas. Offering my ideas in a more systematic way could reduce, for instance, in part, the ambiguity of expressing thoughts in less cohesive ways and forms that are spread throughout with no organized structure through various podcast articles and stuff that I do. Either way, I'm comfortable in the uncertainty of what potential negative influence my ideas might produce. And to the degree to which I can work to assure, such as that's even remotely possible, that my ideas might be deployed in ways that run counter to my end goal preferences, I will do so. And I will also accept the near undeniable fact that my Opportunity to control such outcomes is minimal, as surely as I cannot know whether my silence might also not work against my end goal preferences. To the first concern of committing my ideas to a more permanent repository, a cohesive contained unit such as a book, a series of podcasts, etc., I have greater hesitation. But I believe putting these thoughts to a semi-permanent repository is an action that reinforces within me a willingness and acceptance of not being owned by my ideas or claiming ownership of my ideas. I am, in other words, willing to put my name to a repository of thought that could, in the future, no longer reflect the ideas I contain. I am willing to be, from my perspective, wrong. To the degree to which I can be self-aware regarding the level of certainty I possess with assumptions that have helped me formulate the ideas I'm going to express in this series, I'll do so. And it is my hope that my demonstration of comfort with uncertainty will help ideationally influence others to adopt a less certain position in life and yet find useful, subjectively speaking, structures of thought within frameworks of degrees of certainty that rarely, if ever, achieve absolute certainty. And as I've stated in the beginning, I, I do have a reason for beginning this series with this caveat, and it is to demonstrate some of the assumptions that I'll be articulating in this series, as well as to ground the series. In the start, and this is going to sound strange, to ground the series in the start on a foundation of uncertainty that I hope to show leads to greater self-awareness, which leads to greater opportunities to affect real self-empowering and free association-empowering change at the ground level right where you live. Now we're going to talk about the intentions behind this series. And the first one is satisfying preference. Everything I do is satisfying preference, but but I'm going to identify the most important core preference that I'm satisfying through through doing this series. The intention of this series is a is a layered intention, one that begins first and foremost in my own preferences and serves to satisfy those preferences directly. And it is my assumption, one of the key assumptions that formulate the ideas I will present in this series, that self-awareness is the key to empowering the self to have the greatest opportunity to affect outcomes that favors the self's preferential framework. 
to that end, it is my intention to work through in a systematic manner my assumptions regarding the nature of power and how an understanding of the reality of power equips individuals and free associations to command more opportunities to proactively decide to take or not take action. Uh, and the term reality here being used in the contextual sense of the individual's capacity to perceive and process external influence on the individual's ability or impediment to act, to experience. The purpose here is to simply understand my own thoughts and to test them in a systematic manner. Going in, I begin this series willing to abandon it should I come upon fatal flaws in my assumptions, such as I might perceive them. Going in, I begin this series with a reasonably confident outline that I've developed through a considerable amount of self-reflection, but yet I do possess a willingness to alter that outline as the process of systematic investigation may yet yield unanticipated discoveries that could lead me down, well, unanticipated paths. The act of producing this series is a path to self-discovery in and of itself. Taking ownership of this preference is an essential starting point, as I hope to show throughout this series, that, that makes it possible for me to produce this series at all. Uh, owning the self-interest of your action is, to me, perhaps the greatest act of rebellion against a world that would trap you behind idealistic curtains which hide you from your own self-wizard-creating illusions that I believe prevent you from taking more power than the world would have you believe you possess, than the world would have me believe I possess. Ideational influence. The ideas which I'll be pursuing in this series will hopefully influence others to take ownership of their preferences, to stand on their preferences, and, and not on the edifices of spooks, as Sterner calls them, notions of value that have no objective basis. The ideas which I will be pursuing in this series will hopefully influence others to become more self-aware of the reality of power around them in terms of the limitations placed on them through others, as well as the opportunities to reduce the influences of others on their actions when those influences do not align with their own preference. Conversely, I hope these ideas will influence others to recognize the opportunities to increase the influence of others, not, not just on their own actions, but the actions of others, when those influences do align with their own preferences. In other words, I hope to show the reader, the listener, the viewer, and this is going to be done in many forms. Uh, you're watching on Facebook. You're seeing the, the, the live stream version. There's going to be an audio podcast version. There's a, a YouTube video version, and then there's also the text version, which I'll post on iState.tv. So I hope to show you the benefits of recognizing self-interest in moving the individual towards greater opportunities to satisfy their own preferences. I hope to show the reader, the listener, the viewer, the benefit of recognizing the advantage of free association alignment. And finally, I hope to show the reader, the listener, and the viewer the benefit of working within the capacity that you're able to do so, of course, to empower others to have the same opportunities to satisfy their own preferences, so long as their preferences do not include invoking uh, the implied or direct threat or application of force to influence the actions of others who have not directly threatened or applied force uh, against individuals. Well, I talked about the intentions. Well, how about not the intentions? I want to make that clear. This series is not intended to be a regimented 
Fixed in Time, Space, and Thought System for Self-Empowerment. This series is not intended to be a definitive statement on my assumptions regarding the reality of power and how understanding the reality of power emboldens and equips individuals and free associations to disentangle from the limitations of the course of enterprise governance model that we currently find ourselves surrounded by. This series is not intended to be a blueprint, a closed system model, but rather it is a conversation, one that for my part expressed here is born from a response to what others have spoken in various forms to me, even those who did not share in my core long-term preference, to be influenced as minimally as possible by the direct or indirect threat or application of force by others. While what I express is done so with varying degrees of certainty that must meet a minimal threshold of certainty to even be included in this series, I do not assume that what I express here should be accepted as certainty, nor do I expect that you, the reader, the listener, the viewer, should receive anything I articulate in this series as unquestionable, or that my assumptions should not, could not be challenged by alternative assumptions. This is this is not a work of mathematical precision, nor is it a work of absolute decision, but rather it is a work of assumptions born from the mind of an individual, myself, who recognizes that just about all individuals, again, including myself, have scotomas or, or blind spots, that just about all individuals, including myself, have influences in their lives which presuppositionally condition them to be attracted to certain assumptions that reinforce, sometimes mythologically, courses of action that are, at the end of the day, more of an emotional response to a condition beyond the individual's control than a coherent, self-aware action uh, born from an understanding of preferences and assumptions objectively, such as that remains possible, objectively gained. Yet, for reasons outlined above, despite these limitations I possess, I find it useful not only for me to pursue the work of creating this series with an allowance for following those unanticipated paths should they emerge, but also useful for you if you, like me, uh, if you recognize in yourself a core preference to be empowered to take action in your life that is increasingly less influenced by the implied or direct flat threat or application of force. So this is a conversation. A conversation that I hope to participate in with those who came before me and with those who may be reading, listening, and watching now. A conversation that I, I hope to have especially with those who desire to diminish the influence of the course of enterprise, the state, on their lives and recognize the advantages to themselves to work to diminish the influence of the course of enterprise, the state, on others' lives as well. So what I have planned in the weeks ahead, subject to revision, should uh, unanticipated discoveries alter my course, is first an explanation of the I state, the smallest and most significant sovereign in community. This explanation will also include how I began my own path towards the I state. Next, I plan on discussing the limitations of language itself or of freeing yourself from the seductive ideational power of language, a power that often prevents individuals from discovering similarly held assumptions and preferences because they cling to terms and labels that others find off-putting negative even dangerous, such as the terms capitalism and socialism and the dogmatic battles that occur by those who are, I would argue, owned by words. Words that have become little cathedrals that destroy thought in favor of unquestionable dogma. Once I've set the limitations of language, such as I understand and accept it, I will then take on the task of attempting right after that within the limits of language, of course, to define the terms that I will be using, some of which I've already used, such as preference and power. All of what I've described above will be laying the foundations that will then hopefully 
allow me to present a more thorough theory of the I state, the necessity of the other to the state of I, with some exceptions, and the theory of the reality of power. Finally, I will propose not applications, but guidelines for applications of utilizing the, 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 the theory of the I state and the theory of the reality of power to equip yourself and aid others in equipping themselves to disentangle from the course of enterprise, to see I states emerge. I states that are able to form free association alignments with other I states. In short, I will end this series, barring unanticipated discoveries that lead me down unanticipated paths, with hope, such as I can offer, for a potential eventual end to the model of coercive enterprise governance that has just destroyed so many lives, that has crippled and reduced to shadows and dust the potential of so many more other lives. And what I can promise you in this series is an honest effort, such as I'm able to possess the self-awareness to execute such effort, to pursue ideas that I've held in various forms since I was a child and when I first learned, stunningly at the time, that individuals can and have intentionally create community that reflects the preferences they sought to pursue. And if that journey leads me to prematurely end this series, so be it. If that journey leads me to deviate with the, the outline that I have formed and crafted over a period of uh, two years, then so be it. I invite you to join me in this journey, to contribute in this conversation, to influence me ideationally in the same way that I unapolog unapologetically hope to influence you.